All right, go to Romans chapter 1, verse 17. We're, talking about living, we're going to be talking about living by faith tonight. This is a sermon that I was going to preach in um, Fayetteville. <laughs> it's, I got down there and it just didn't work. It's one of those things you got ready, you got ready to preach. You had to change right there in the middle of worship. You had to change everything because you were sitting there going, this ain't going to work. Hallelujah. Just so we'll, just, we'll bring it back here and we'll use it here. Hallelujah. You'll get it. First time you, you get be the first crowd to get it. Hallelujah. Uh, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, just shall live by faith. Uh, tonight I want to share, and we probably won't, we won't stay you know, real, real long. We may get done by 7.30, if not earlier. Uh, it might be a miracle if we get done by then, but it, it could happen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just like if the ACC has any teams left over after today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, we're talking, we're going to share about uh, living by faith, sin the underminer. You know, we, we, we uh, teach a lot about having faith, living by faith, speaking faith, doing faith. And, um, but you know, sin can undermine that. Now, this is not to condemn you. This is to say, hey, let's have a locator. If there's stuff in your life that's causing a condemnation within your own heart, it'll affect your ability to exercise your faith. And if you're going to live by faith, you got to have things out of your life that undermine your faith. That went over big. It's still true. Hallelujah. Let's go to 1 John, if you will, the third chapter. We'll pick up down around verse 19 or so. Actually, we will pick up in verse 19. 1 John chapter 3, verse 19. And hereby know we that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Now, that doesn't mean that he overlooks it. It just means that there is an answer to the condemnation of your heart. And it's found in the forgiveness of God and the restoration of God. Verse 20, very key here. For if our heart condemn us, I'm sorry, verse 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask... We receive of him because we keep his commandments and do, all, do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, let me say this. You have to take the Bible as a whole. John said this is his commandment. But notice in the previous verse, it said keep his commandments. The primary commandment of all things is the, is the commandment of love. That is the number one commandment. You know, Jesus said, on this hinge all the law and the prophets. Okay? You know, that, you know we're to keep his commands. You know, um, what's that song we used to sing? Um, da, 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 That your joy may be full. There you go. I can't remember how it started off. This is his commandment. That we love one another. That your joy may be full. All right. Well, you know, he says here that we, if we keep his commandments... And this is his commandment, that we love the Lord Jesus. We believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave commandment. Now, if you just take that and pull it out, you can go around and start teaching that the only commandment God gave is a one commandment, and that's the commandment of love. I, I've read Paul's writings, and there's more than one commandment there. Okay? You know, you, you have to take it as a whole and not and, and, and cherry-pick things out and try to make them say something they really weren't saying. Because John even said that we're to keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And then he comes back and reiterates the number one commandment is, is believing on Jesus. If you don't believe on Jesus, you're not even in the kingdom. And, and, and then walking in love one to another. This, how, this is how we know that we're of the family of God because we have love one to another. John had already said that in this, in this uh, book. He's, you know, we know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. All right? And so... The you know, commandment of love is the, is the highest, highest of all, believing on Jesus, walking in love, but it's not the only thing. Um, something that God's been revealing to me as, as of late is, you know, Jesus made an interesting statement when he said, I came not to do away with the law, but I came to fulfill it. Keeping in effect and intact the moral code of God's law. Because if you go back and study, the majority of the law dealt with um, between ceremonial, ceremonial washings and ordinances of, of sacrifice and moral code. 
I mean, there are some things about loving the Lord your God with all your heart and that kind of thing, okay? You know, uh, the, the top ten, you know, God in there, don't use his name in vain, you know, um, you know, don't have any idols before him, that kind of thing. But there's a lot of laws that just deal with your moral code. Jesus didn't come to undo the moral code. And this, this is the misrepresentation by some that teach things like it doesn't matter what you do. Because you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, as we read the other night, Paul said that we're to glorify our God with our bodies and our spirit, which are God's. Okay? So, so how do, do we get to the point that we don't have confidence toward God? Well, he said if our heart condemns us, God doesn't condemn you. God's provided a means whereby you can have forgiveness. God's provided a means whereby you can get restoration, but your own heart will condemn you. Now, run with me, if you will, to Romans, the eighth chapter. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then um, we have confidence toward God. Whatever we ask God, we know we have the petitions we desire of him. All right, but up in Romans chapter 8, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, I had somebody argue with me one day, oh, that's not in the, you know, the, all Greek scholars agree that that's not in the original. They took it from verse 4. Well, if you read the whole thing, it would still say the same thing. You know, for the law of the Spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, then it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own Son in likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of God, righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, if you don't walk after the Spirit, you're walking after the flesh, you're going to receive condemnation. And it won't have to necessarily come from God. Uh, John says, if our heart condemn us not, your own heart will tell you something's wrong. And what it, it breaks your confidence between you and the Father. Now, we got people trying to convince us to go ahead and continue walking in that path because, we're gonna, because God's going to do stuff for us anyway. No, you see, if, if it's not a faith, it's sin. What's not a faith is sin. And if your heart's condemning you, even trying to, you, you don't have any confidence toward God, so you're not in faith. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Where does, where does the faith of the believer come into play when you've missed the mark? Hebrews chapter 4. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace in the time of need that we may receive, we may obtain mercy and help. Amen? Find, and find, might obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. You have you got, you got a promise that you can come even when you've you know, missed it. It's not limited to just sin. But, you know, you've got, a, you've got a promise that the throne of grace is available to you in the time of need. Praise God. I say praise God to that. Amen? Not run off and tell everybody that I'm under grace and it don't matter. No. There is a grace to restore you, to cleanse you, to forgive you, and to remove the condemnation your own heart's given you, which is a separation between you and the Father. The inability to come into his presence free from guilt and condemnation because you, you, you're, you're, in, you're involved in sin is not something we should take lightly and play with and just ignore. We should deal with it. <clears throat> not in the manner of how lousy you are and how horrible you are and how much of a, of a dirt bag you are, but in light of the fact that what I've done is, is contrary to his word, contrary to the moral code of God, it's in violation to the laws of God, moral laws of God, and that it has brought a condemnation to my own heart unless you try to appease yourself and convince yourself it's not there. And usually other people are trying to convince you for you. Amen. Now, when should we tell people there's no condemnation? They're not in condemnation. When they've repented. And they've been cleansed by the washing of the, of the, of the, of the, of the blood of Jesus. Our advocate has argued our case and based it on the blood. We've been cleansed from that thing. Then we say, now, now, don't, don't take thought to that anymore. Don't live in condemnation and regret to that action anymore. You've been cleansed from it. Amen. But while you haven't done that, don't try to convince people to live free from the condemnation of it. Oh, that's just law. That's flesh. No, that's Bible. Two amens, three grunts, and four holy somethings. Moans or something. I think I heard a couple of moans out there. <clears throat> so, if our heart condemns us not, then have we confident toward God. And um, 
And then we said here, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, the argument over this is that in the RV, the Revised Version, um, it's not there. Now, you understand, there's, there's been, since the late 1800s, there's been a big, big dispute over the majority text and the minority text. The minority text is what all the, and you understand, most of our modern versions after 1880 or something like that are all based on the RV. And not on the King James. They, they went to the RV and so they use that. Without actually, and a lot of times they don't even go back to the Greek as much as they go to the RV and use its translational things. And there's a lot of discrepancy between the RV and the, and, and the AV. Authorized version. Revised version. Okay. You got, the, you got the NRV, the new revised version. You got the, a, the RV revised version, which was the first of the more modern translations. And they use the minority text. And there's a lot of, you go in there, some things, you read them and you go, ooh, ooh, ooh. You kind of look at it and you go, oh, man, that's not even, that, that, that's almost anti, you know, Jesus is the Savior stuff sometimes. So you have to, you know, I, I, pretty much I am a, I'm a big adherent to uh, the, the accuracy of the King James in, in holding to the majority text. Although I'll use other versions for insight, you know, I don't, I don't change and go, well, it's, if it's, it's not in the RV, therefore, therefore it's not, all Bible scholars agree it's not the truth. Well, all Bible scholars up until 1880-something agreed that it was, it was the truth. Okay, <laughs> you know, last 130 years, they've, they've changed. So, thank you for your enthusiasm. How many know, you know, Mark, 9, Mark 15, uh, 9 through 20 is not in the RV. And if you read the Amplified, it's all in italics. It says this in the most manuscripts don't have, they know the manuscript that they were using, which is the minority text. You know, they'll lay hands on sick, they'll cast out devils, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's not in there. They say. They say it was added or whatever. You know, I, I'm just... I, I just kind of get funny about people getting revelations thousands of years later, you know, uh, when they had they, they, guys for centuries with, with manuscripts back as far back as when they did it, they were doing it in 400 and stuff like that. Now we come along you know, 1,600 years later and say, ah, they didn't know what they were talking about. All right? Amen. Whoop. Now. So, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, sin is a faith inhibitor. Now, again, this is not to make you feel bad. It's to address something. If you're trying to live by faith, I, I remember one time we had someone in the church, and, and, and their particular lifestyle they were living in was ungodly. They, were, they, could, they wanted to know why things weren't working for you. You're not, you're not living the way according to the Word teaches well, no, 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 God made me this way. No, he didn't make you that way. And then why the faith wouldn't work. Your faith won't work when you're living in, in rebellion to the word. There is an undercurrent. Even when you try to appease your mind, your heart will condemn you. See, your heart's spiritual. God's spirit. Not a spirit. I mean, not spirit. Not spirit cosmically. He is a individual, unique spirit. Okay? I sorry, I about got that backwards. Um, God is a spirit. He is not spirit like in cosmic force, woo, cloud stuff. He's, he's, he is a person, all right? And our spirit obviously functions in what realm? Spirit realm. <clears throat> and so it, it recognizes inhibitions between you and the Father. Amen? Glory to God. Um, look if over in the Hebrews chapter 9. Moses, the Hebrew. Hebrews 9, 11. But Christ being become a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now let me say this. Understand every position you have in reference to God is a position of in Christ. When you're born again, you are, you are baptized into the body of Christ. You do not have eternal redemption outside of Jesus Christ. 
And if you leave that position of being in Christ, you don't keep the redemption. The eternity of the redemption is between God and the man, the man Christ Jesus. You partake of it through the new birth and getting in Christ. If you get out of Christ, you get out of it. Hebrews 6 lays out the, lays out the plan for that or the, the, the conditions for that. And, uh, you know, it's not an easy thing to do, but it can be done. Adam knew what he was doing when he committed high treason. Hello? He, he understood what he was doing. He understood the consequences of what he was doing. But he did it anyway. Um, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge a conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hallelujah. And see, this is what we're after. We're after a clean conscience. But I can tell you that sin violates your conscience. Now, you can put it down, and you can try to muddy up the voice of it. We can all refuse to hear the voice of our spirit, the recreated human spirit. We can all muddy that up with, with activity or stuff or, you know, telling ourselves it's all okay. And keep, you, you can keep telling yourself that, but it doesn't change. It doesn't make it okay. When your conscience becomes violated, you lose your confidence before God. Not that God casts you aside. He's already made a provision. Then the event, look now, go with me now over to First John again. He's already made a provision for you that if you miss the mark or if you sin, he's made a provision to bring reconciliation and restoration back into your life. So he's not looking to boot you. Hello? Your own heart will condemn you. Your conscience will become violated, and you won't have confidence toward God. Um, and this is why I'm, I'm just adamant about the people who preach the First John 1-9 is not for the church. They're just bozos. And I, and I say that in love, of course. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let's back up a little bit. If we walk in the light, it's he's in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, or basically you can say this, if we say we never sinned, we deceive ourselves, and the truth, the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. Verse 1 of chapter 2. My little children, these things write unto you that ye do what? Sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. What is that? The word advocate is a legal term in, 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 in the, the, uh, the, the realm of lawyer. Someone to argue your case. So here we, we pick this up. He's saying, you know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What happens when we get cleansed from all unrighteousness? Our, what's, what's purged? The blood of Jesus purges our, according to Hebrews 9, the blood of Jesus purges our conscience. Where's your conscience? Your conscience is, is part of, a part of the, the soul of man, which is intact with the spirit of man. Amen. If our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. I said, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And, and the blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Getting down to the second chapter, we write these things that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. See, it's not the condemnation of God. God's condemning you, telling you how rotten you are. Your own heart starts to tell you how rotten you are. God's made provision that if you feel rotten, you can come get cleansed. It is foolish, however, to continue in sin. That went over big. Paul wrote to the church and said, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. See, if you don't deal with it, there is that separation. And what's going to happen? The more you yield to the, to the condemnation and guilt that you feel. See, we, well, if you preach sin in the church, people are going to sin. No, they're not. Paul didn't, you know, Paul didn't write and say, look, I know that if I tell you about not sinning, you're going to keep sinning more, but I'm going to write it anyway. That's not what he did. John didn't say that either. He said, I'm writing this stuff unto you so you sin not. Right. But if any man sin, if you sin, 
There's an advocate. What is, that? What, is he, what is he telling us? That there's already been provision made in the event that if you sin and, and have, a, have a conscience that is condemned before God in your own heart, God has already made a way to get you back into full restoration. And that's love, that's grace. But there is action on the part of the believer necessary. See, part of repentance is the acknowledgement that what you did was wrong and violated God's moral code, moral law. I'm talking about for the, for the you know, for, for the, for the uh, when it was, if it's a moral thing, things can be spiritual. But, you know, if it's, if it's a moral issue, you know, you, to, in, order to, in order to repent, you've got to acknowledge what you did was wrong. We got a lot of people trying not to acknowledge what they did was wrong. As a matter of fact, they try and say it's okay because I'm under grace. It really don't matter. See, that, that's just wrong. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not how God teaches. I'm telling you, you're hurting your own faith. You're hurting your faith in the long run. You're doing damage to your ability to function within the parameters of what God called you to do, and that is to live by faith. Amen. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Everybody say, I'm enthusiastic. Hallelujah. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First, Corneth, as we've been finding out in our study, probably 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is probably 4 Corinthians. Hallelujah. Probably, we just don't have the other two letters. This is, know ye not that they which run a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. This is what Paul says here. But I keep my body under and bring you into subjection. Lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I should find myself a castaway. Now, people don't like to read that scripture. Hello? Paul said, I keep my body under. I bring it into subjection. What's he talking about? He's talking about maintaining and dictating to your body and controlling the appetites of the flesh in a way that honors God. He says, lest but when I've preached to others, I become a castaway myself. What? You're saying that if he doesn't control his body, he could become a castaway? That's what he said. Can I get a woot woot? All right, praise the Lord. Can I get a raise the roof kind of thing or something? I mean, I need some kind of feedback. I mean, you know, like, yo, go ahead on, pastor. Bring it now, something. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, I could tell y'all excited. Um, that's first. I was, I'm saying okay, okay, Hebrews now. I was looking. I, it's the same chapter. No. Look over. Let's run over to Hebrews twelve. So what? What are we saying here? We found out that the conscience of man is an inhibitor if it's if it's condemned. It inhibits your ability because he says here, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. What does that tell us if our heart is condemning us? We don't have confidence toward God. And he goes, if our heart, and if we have confidence toward God, then we have the things we ask of him. Well, if your heart is condemning you, guess what you don't have? Why don't you have it? Because God doesn't want to do it? He's mad at you? No. Because when your heart's condemning you, you don't have confidence toward God. If you don't have confidence toward God, you're not in faith. You're out of faith. You really don't believe he's going to do it because you've got a condemnation in your own heart. That's why it's important to stay repentant, clean before the Lord, honor the Lord. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the last verse, Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Back up, you'll find out. He's talking about that you know, your body was purchased too. You, don't, you just don't get to do this spiritual thing and leave, that, leave the body out. Well, it don't matter as long as my spirit's before the Lord. You know, you cherry pick scriptures when you do that. Read them in whole context. You'll find out God demands the proper use of the body. 
Amen. Paul told us to offer our bodies to God as a, as a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable. King James and Greek can say better, a little bit better, spiritual service. Amen. Your body says a living sacrifice is a spiritual service. What do you mean a living sacrifice? You're constantly keeping it from living the way it wants to live. Carnal. Now we live in a, in a, in a generation, not just a, 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 a society, we live in a generation of if it feels good, do it. Whatever your flesh wants to do, cater to your flesh. Give in to your flesh. How many remember all you can eat buffets in the late in, in the sixties? In the sixties, all right. They, you, you, you have some, but guess what? They are they're everywhere now. Everybody has an all you can eat something. I mean, somebody. I mean, all the time there's somewhere. I mean, all you can eat. I remember remember the day that, that Shoney's went to the all you can eat breakfast buffet. Now, why would you have an all you can eat buffet? You could not put over the top of the buffet bar the temperance bar. You would have to call it the gluttonous bar. Wouldn't you? Because, you know, somehow in our mind we go, well, I paid $10 for this, and I know I'm already full on the first trip, but it's all you could eat. And your mind goes, I, I've got to get my money's worth. So you walk out there loosening your belt. Going, oh, Lord, I shouldn't have done that. Have you ever done it? I, I, I'm about to get where I go to places now, even if it's all you can eat. I'm, I'm like, and when I hit the wall, I hit the wall, and that's it. I just can't, I just can't put any more in. I'm just not going to do it because then you're miserable. Miserable for the rest of the day. Woo! I paid whatever dollars and be miserable. No, just enjoy the experience and eat what you can and quit. Amen. But we, we live in a societal mindset of flesh, gator to the flesh. Paul's mindset was keep your body under. Amen. Hebrews 12, 1. Seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race. What race do we run? The race of faith. That is set before us. So think about this. There's even things in your life that aren't sinful, but there's weights. TV. I heard TV. Can I hear Dr. Pepper? <laughs> Cheer wine slushy. Ooh, yeah. All right. Steak and shake. Okay. So... Paul said to lay aside weights and sin. What do they do? What do they do to us? See, this is, this is why I don't understand the preaching of a message that says it doesn't matter what you do with your body because you're under grace. Paul said to lay aside sin, to lay aside weights. And, and listen, he said to lay aside the sin and even if it's just a weight, not a sin, lay it aside. Why? Because it easily, what? Besets us. Well, if you just teach them who they are in Christ, they, they, they won't sin. Hogwash. I said hogwash. Paul taught all kinds of things to the church. Actually, he's the one who taught, have all the in He is the in him guy. Yeah, he wrote the in hymns. In whom? In Christ. He wrote probably about 95% of the scriptures that refer to in whom, in Christ, along those lines that we have in Dad Hagen's book in the back of all the list of the scriptures of being in him. Paul wrote them. But he also tells you to, to do things and cover your body and make sure your body's under control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even with the revelation of who we were in Christ, he still said don't do stuff. Why? Here's right here. Hebrews 12, 1 tells us why. Because it will easily beset you. See, when you justify giving to the flesh under the guise that it doesn't matter or somehow it's already covered and I can get away with it, you have set yourself up to be beset. You've positioned yourself to be beset. 
What do you mean? Get knocked off course. Get knocked off track. He said lay aside those things. The weights and the sins that it possess. And let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus. Now let me say something, folks. Can I be real pretty blunt here? You can't be fornicating and looking at Jesus. You can't be shooting up and smoking dope, drinking, and looking at Jesus. Now, you may justify it in your head, but you can't do it and look at Jesus. There's, I heard of one church not that long ago that the men's fellowship are stogie parties. They get together and smoke stogie, cigars, big cigars, and drink beer. And that's their men's fellowship. Now, I've got one question. Why? To what profit is it to sit around and smoke a bunch of stogies and drink beer and talk about how free you are? Would you, know, you know what you're doing? Even if it weren't a sin, it would be a weight because you're setting yourself up to be beset. I smoke this to the glory of God. No more, you can't do that anymore. You can say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gorge myself and go throw up so I can eat some more to the glory of God. You can't do that either. I'm going to run around with so-and-so's wife to the glory of God. You can't do that. So you can't be looking at Jesus and doing the things that violate his moral law and code. Thank you for your answer. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before us endured the, shame, endured the cross, despising the shame thereof. Glory to God. And is set down at the right hand of, uh, of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You've not resisted unto blood striving against him. Like you remember in the garden, he, he, he bled from, from his sweat. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For the Lord loveth he, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son he receiveth. If you endure, now let me say something here. We got this mind, somehow or another in the charismatic word, of, particularly word of faith circles, we got this idea God, God would never rebuke us for doing wrong. Hello. If you endure chastening, God dealeth you with sons. For what son is he whom his father chasteneth not? But if you, with, if, you will be without, if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Now, people don't like, they don't read, I don't hear that read in church often. Kind of just skip that. We start out in Hebrews 12, 1, run with patience the race is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We just leave off the part that if you don't do, if you don't receive the chasing or the correction of the Lord, you're a bastard. We just kind of leave that one alone. I don't know if people don't, don't want to cuss in church. That's not cussing. It's in the Bible. And if you just call, start calling people that, that's, that's not right, you know, nor, nor calling them a female dog. Hello. But he says here that if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. If not, you're illegitimate. God will correct you. Now, let me say this. God's spirit does speak to your spirit when you sin and then your spirit, own spirit. Because here's what happens. You sin, and the Holy Spirit, remember we're the temple of the Holy Ghost? And he speaks to us in that still small voice, and the Holy Ghost nudges you and says, that was wrong. Not in a condemn way, a condemning way, but a, you know, a correcting way. Now, what usually follows that is, you know, oh, yeah, that was wrong, and then condemnation comes. But in, 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 the, new, in the new, it used to be when you condemn, you, you would repent and ask God to forgive you. In the new world, we just say, I'm under grace, it don't matter. And, you, and here's another thing. Not only does it mess up your faith, Paul, it messes up your ability to hear the voice of God because when you reject his dealings. So, Pastor, why, are you, why, why is this such a big deal? Have you seen what's going on out there in the church? On Christian television and all over the place? And when the churches are springing up all over the place teaching this stuff and people are getting into it and people just, and you got churches now who won't even talk about things because they'll lose people? No. Well, I mean, we don't have far to go, so praise the Lord. You, know, you, st you stick it out, and the more people will come, they're going to come because they're willing to take it. 
Actually, it's a sign of maturity that you can handle and, and keep growing when, you, when it's not fun. There has to be a church that's willing to take the stand for God. And uh, people, I'm not talking about this, a local church. I'm talking about the church itself. Because it, it's being divided along lines of those who are going to follow the Spirit and those who are going to follow the flesh. And those who follow the flesh are going to be beset. The Bible even talks about the fact that the days weren't short and the very let themselves would be lost. And there is an apostasy coming to the church, a falling away. The word falling away comes from the Greek apostate. It means to fall away, you know, apostasy. We call it apostasy to fall away from the faith. We don't want to be, and it's no flesh of for the elect's sake, for whom he's chosen, he's shortened the days. I'm telling you. There's, there's a lot of stuff just going on in the church. And we've got to become more spiritual and less fleshly as we go through this. Can you say amen? All right. But if you, okay, we've already covered that. Then are you bastards and not sons? Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For, ver, for they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but for our profit, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Ooh. God's correction comes. So he can partake of his holiness. Do you know there's a scripture that says without holiness no man shall see the Lord? New Testament scripture, by the way. He's dealing with us so we can, we can partake of his holiness. Now no chasing for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the profitable, the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So God does deal with us he doesn't condemn us, your heart will condemn you. It, it, it happened because the Spirit of God said, no, you know, actually what was going on was before you did it, he was telling you don't do it. Now, how many of you have ever been in that place where you're getting don't do it, don't do it, you did it anyway, and as soon as you did it, bleh. So that was the condemnation that came. Your heart was condemning you. The Holy Spirit was trying to stop you before you got there. Stop it, stop it, stop it. You're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. No. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. Now you feel rotten, don't you? Yep. Well, come on to the throne of grace. No, I'm under grace, Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm already under grace. No, 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 no. You've got to come to the throne to obtain the mercy and the grace. You can't claim its benefits before you operate in the, in the principles of the forgiveness that's available, but you have to operate in the principles. It's just like that if you, you go to church and say, well, yeah, I believe Jesus is God's son and never confess him as Lord and go to hell. You, might, you missed the part of the principle. Well, I went to church. Yeah, I believe he's God's son. But you know what? I'm not willing to give my life to him. I'll get you, I'll get you a one-way ticket to hell. And can you, can you imagine people in hell who just wouldn't give the life to the Lord and they believed in him and said, well, I believe he's God's son. But I'm not willing to sacrifice or give up or, or yield to his lordship and wake up in hell realizing that if they just confessed to his lord and accepted and walked with him, they wouldn't be there just so they could party. Your flesh is the stupidest reason in the world to go to hell. The dictates and demands and desires of your flesh. Hallelujah. So, what do we do? Well, if sin comes into our life, and it didn't come without your cooperation, it just doesn't. You don't wake up, you can't pull a Flip Wilson, the alter ego Geraldine, and go, the devil made me do it, baby. Now, unless you're demon-possessed, the devil can't make you do anything. You have to yield to it. Hello? So you have to yield to it. And it is a choice. If you've made the choice to yield to it, you're going to have to repent. Now, repent, I know, you see, sometimes we take, we take the, these concordance definitions of stuff, and, and a lot of times they're, they're very limited. Now, understand Strong's is a very good reference 
But a lot of times, Strong's definitions are limited in their scope. You do some digger deep, and there's, there's more stuff there. There's more background to it, okay? And so, you know, and you can't go into, if you did, every, if you did it Strong's and did every word with the full background on it, uh, you, you'd, you'd have a really, really, really big book, okay? So it's, it's a good starting place, but you're going to have to do some more. You know, just to say that, you know, repentance means to change your mind is limited. Yeah, you've got to have a change of what you're, how you think. Yeah, you do have to have a change the way you think. You do have to change the way you, you, you view this. But it also is going to have to include, you know, uh, godly sorrow work with repentance. That means that they're sorrow for doing wrong. And that's the scripture. God, you know, there's a sorrow in the world, but godly sorrow work with repentance. You got the sorrow. You're, you're genuinely sorry, repentive. You're, you're, you're grieved that you grieve God by doing that. That's godly sorrow. And it brings a change to you where you ask for forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Which means he's going to argue your case based on the fact that you've come to the throne. You've come to grace. You're obtaining mercy and grace in the time of need. And he's applying the blood to cleanse your conscience, of, uh, to cleanse your conscience from dead works. Amen. Now, the moment that's done, you can go right back on and get right back in the groove of living by faith instantly. That's where you confess. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Because the minute it's under the blood, you're in the Spirit, you're not in the flesh about that issue in your life. Amen? But you, let's not put the cart before the horse. Let's not see there's no, let's not get to there's no condemnation when you haven't done the other part of repenting for it. And do not let people tell you that you don't have to and it doesn't belong to you and it's not in the Bible for you. They even found some Bible that somebody translated not all that long ago. They left 1 John 1 9 completely out of it and they all started touting that as a better version. Why? Because it matched their narrative. Well, the Jehovah's Witness did the same thing. They wrote their own Bible to match their narrative that Jesus was a God and not the Son of God or God. They, they, they wrote their own Bible and put in there the, the article A to make it a God, meaning not he was not equal to God. Well, that's matching your narrative. We don't get and change and manipulate to match a narrative. Hello? We have to let the Bible create the narrative and then substantiate it. Forgiveness is throughout the Bible. But so is repentance. John, uh, James even wrote to church said, confess your faults one to another. In other words, you know, th there's, there's a place where you, if you're weak, and that, that doesn't mean you go over and say, hey, hey, I, uh, I shot up last week. It was talk it's talking about finding accountability for areas in your life where you're struggling with. I'm, I'm having a problem here. I need, I need accountability in my life. Hello? Because I, I, I don't want to live this way. See, that's, that's a heart that says, I don't want to live this way, and I need accountability to help me. Because I'm struggling here for some reason, and I just want somebody checking up on me saying, hey, how you doing? Amen? Praise the Lord. All right. Pray. Anybody enjoy that? Two people? Three? Four? Can I get 100%? Hallelujah. <laughs> 